and my father is the gardener. He breaks off every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and he prunes every branch that does bear fruit, so that it will be clean and bear more fruit. You have been made clean already by the teaching I have given you. Remain united to me, and I will remain united to you. A branch cannot bear fruit by itself. It can do so only if it remains in the vine. In the same way, you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. And you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will bear much fruit. For you can do nothing without me. Those who do not remain in me are thrown out like a branch and dry up. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire, where they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask for anything you wish, and you shall have it. My Father's glory is shown by your bearing much fruit, and in this way you become my disciples. I love you, just as the Father loves me. Remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My commandment is this, love one another, just as I love you. The greatest love you can have for your friends is to give your life for them, and you are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends, because I have told you everything I heard from my father. You did not choose me. I chose you, and appointed you to go and bear much fruit, the kind of fruit that endures. And so, the father will give you whatever you ask of him in my name. This, then, is what I command you. Love one another. If the world hates you, just remember that it has hated me first. 
If you belong to the world, then the world would love you as its own. But I chose you from this world, and you do not belong to it. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. Slaves are not greater than their master. If people persecuted me, they will persecute you too. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours too. But they will do all this to you because you are mine. For they do not know the one who sent me. They would not have been guilty of sin if I had not come and spoken to them. As it is, they no longer have any excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me, hates my father also. They would not have been guilty of sin if I had not done among them the things that no one else ever did. As it is, they have seen what I did. And they hate both me and my father. This, however, was bound to happen, so that what is written in their law may come true. They hated me for no reason at all. The Helper will come, the Spirit who reveals the truth about God and who comes from the Father. I will send him to you from the Father and he will speak about me, and you too will speak about me, because you have been with me from the very beginning. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing." If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world... But I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause." But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. 
In chapter 14, Jesus gave a staggering teaching that if anyone loves Jesus, the Father and the Son will come to that person and make their home with that person. Jesus wants his disciples to understand the close, intimate relationship that is available for those who follow him. Jesus is now going to show what this means for us as his followers in John chapter 15. Jesus is going to use a well-known image to communicate to his followers the glorious relationship that we have with our God. This is, in verse 1, the seventh and final I am statement in John's Gospel. The vine is used throughout the scriptures to represent Israel, the people of God. In Psalm 80 and in verse 8, Israel is called the vine that was brought out of Egypt. In Isaiah 5, we see Israel called a degenerate vine. In Jeremiah 2 and in verse 21, we see the same connection of Israel as this degenerate vine. In chapters 15, 17, and 19 of Ezekiel, we see Israel called the vine also. But in John 15, notice what Jesus does. Jesus identifies himself as Israel. Not only this, but he is the true Israel. Jesus is teaching that Israel, as God designed it to be, had failed. The prophets that we just noted all made this point. But it is not the end of God's plan for the world or for his people. Jesus will succeed where Israel failed. He is everything that God desired. Now, when you look again in the book of Isaiah, you'll read about Israel's failure giving way to the promises of the one who will not fail in bringing a light to the nations and bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. The physical nation of Israel has been supplanted by Jesus, who is the true vine. Notice also that the father is described as the expert farmer who is cultivating this relationship. The father who cultivated the vine relationship with Israel is now cultivating this relationship with Jesus as the true vine. In verse 2, Jesus describes what it means for us that Jesus is the true vine and the Father is the vine dresser. One of the key themes to this gospel has been to describe who are true disciples of Jesus. Many messages have been given by Jesus to show who are truly his versus those who just claim to belong to God. Jesus returns to this in the final night of his life before his crucifixion. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. It does not matter what you have done in your past. If you're not bearing fruit, then you are cut off. No fruit means that we do not belong to Jesus because fruitfulness is the mark of a branch. Claiming to be a disciple means nothing. Believing one is a Christian means nothing. There is not a question concerning who is a Christian and who is not. There is clear evidence as to who belongs to Jesus, and that is fruitfulness. We are not able to remain in a relationship with Jesus and not bear fruit. I also find it interesting that Jesus does not say that if you are bearing fruit, then everything is going to be easy and wonderful. The reality is that we will not have a pain-free life. God is going to prune us so that we are more fruitful. Pruning is the removal of all things that in inhibit growth. Suffering is directed by God to cause us to bear fruit. God does not coddle us or shelter us so that we will bear fruit. The painful process is to lead us to a continuing profitable life. Verse 3 is what Jesus said when they first were in the upper room as Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. These disciples are cleansed because of the words that Jesus has spoken. Jesus' teaching is life-giving and cleansing. The scriptures are the agent of our spiritual growth and change. This means that we do not come to the word of God just for spiritual facts. We come to the scriptures bringing our hearts to the pruning blade of the Father. We open the word of God and submit our lives to those words so that we can remain in Jesus and thus be pruned rather than ignore the scriptures and be removed. 
Notice the beginning of verse 4. This statement is another reason why we must see that Jesus is not talking about a mystical indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Rather, Jesus is talking about intimacy of relationship. Jesus abides, dwells, remains in us, is the same way that we abide, dwell, and remain in Jesus. The picture of remaining in Jesus is illustrated for us in this verse. A branch cannot bear fruit by itself. The branch must be connected and live in the vine. Branches derive their life from the vine, and the vine produces fruit through those branches. Now notice what Jesus says here, because this is powerful. We cannot bear fruit unless we remain or live in Jesus. Verse 5 presses the point even further. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. Obviously, Jesus does not mean this in an absolute sense. You can be separated from Christ and still do all kinds of activities. The point is that you can do nothing towards God if you are separated from Christ. I think it's important to recognize the proper flow of this teaching. We cannot reverse what Jesus is saying. We are not saved because we bear fruit. Bearing fruit, however, is the product of salvation. The vine and branches imagery helps us to see that. The reason the branch bears fruit is because it is connected to the vine. The branch cannot be disconnected from the vine, bear fruit, and then be connected to the vine. Fruit is only born when the branch is first connected to the vine. This means, in light of this, that we are to evaluate our lives. If we do not see spiritual fruit, there's a problem. The problem is very clear. Verse 7, we are not remaining in Christ because his words are not living in us. Jesus says this in a number of places in the Gospel of John. John chapter 8, we saw this, here in John chapter 15, and then later in John chapter 17. If someone says that they are struggling spiritually and having problems with their faith, I want us to see that Jesus has the clear answer. Remain in Jesus by remaining in the Word of God. This is the medicine that no one wants to take but it is clearly prescribed by the Lord. We look for other answers instead. We want other people to change. We want our circumstances to change. We want everything else to change, but our own spiritual habit of not dwelling in Jesus. In verse 8, Jesus describes for us the importance of fruitfulness. First, God is glorified by our fruitfulness. Remember, we exist for God's glory. Our purpose is to show the glory of God to the world. We are to be the lights of the glory of God to the ends of the earth. Secondly, we prove that we are disciples of Jesus by bearing fruit. Fruitfulness is the evidence of our discipleship. It is not possible to be a disciple of Jesus and not show ever-increasing fruit. When we remain in Christ, we will bear fruit. The Father will prune us so that we can be more fruitful. Therefore, we look at the challenges and difficulties of life by faith, asking how this suffering can be used for the glory of God and bear fruit for Jesus all the more. Verse 9, Jesus gives a mind-blowing declaration that I think we need to really consider here. Notice verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Think about that for a moment. Think about how deep the Father's love is for the Son. I believe this is another reason why the second person of the Godhead is given the term Son. Not only is Christ the Son because he shows subordination to the will of the Father, but the Father and Son terminology pictures a depth of love that is inexpressible. Do not think that because the apostles are the audience for Jesus at this moment, that this statement does not apply to us. In fact, in just a few paragraphs, Jesus will pray to the Father, desiring that those who believe in Jesus through the word of the apostles will know that Jesus loves us as the Father loved him. We'll see that in John chapter 17. 
In verse 10, Jesus now calls for his disciples to remain in his love. Live your life in the love of Jesus. Well, how do we do this? Is remaining in the love of Christ simply a feeling, warm and fuzzy emotion? How do we remain in that incomprehensible love? Jesus explains it in verse 10. Jesus remained in the Father's love by keeping his Father's commandments. In the same way, we remain in the love of Jesus by keeping his commandments. I do not believe the point that Jesus is making is that when you obey Jesus, then he loves you. But when you disobey Jesus, well, now he doesn't love you anymore. No, I don't believe that at all. That would mean that you're just flinging in and out of the love of Christ by every decision that you make. There is no comfort or hope if that is the case. If remaining in the love of Christ depends upon my obedience to his commands, then I am certainly doomed. My joy will never be full if every sin and every mistake takes me out of the love of Christ. So I don't think that that is the point that Jesus is making, since it does not fit the rest of the teachings in Scripture about the love of Christ. Rather, loving the Lord is not about having a feeling, but it is a call to obedience. We cannot say that we love the Lord, but then not keep his commandments. Now, I think by all standards, human standards, what Jesus is saying here is fairly radical. And I think we can easily miss it because of that. Too often we approach the Lord in terms of straight obedience. Obedience is depicted as our duty and our hardship. Obedience is pictured as something we have to do. In our own words, we see this kind of thinking come out. We speak of having to go to church. We ask if we have to do something for the Lord. Do we have to go to Bible classes? Do we have to read the scriptures? Obedience is pictured as slavery, keeping us from doing the things that we want to do. I mean, is that the picture that Jesus shows for us about what it means to remain in the love of the Father? That Jesus left us this example that, you know, he served the Father in obedient misery? Obedience was, you know, a duty and a hardship and doom and gloom? Well, no, that's not what Jesus pictured at all. Obedience to the Father did not keep Jesus from doing all the things he wanted to do. What Jesus wanted to do was be obedient to the Father. It's not that we have to obey to show our love. It's that we love the Lord and we want to show that love, which is only displayed through obedience to the Lord. When we are living in the love of the Lord, we will want to obey. This is what Jesus is saying. No one is living in the love of the Lord and not obeying Jesus. That's been the point of the first eight verses of chapter 15 here. Branches that are remaining in Jesus bear fruit. Remaining in the love of Christ means that we will do as he asks of us. Obedience to the Lord is the means to full, lasting joy. Joy logically follows when disciples realize that loving Christ is true life. This is what will fill us. This is what we are looking for. Satan tries to deceive us that his temptations are the way to true joy and that God's way is just too restrictive and joyless. The world insists that turning from sin to follow Christ will take away all your joy and all your pleasures in life. Jesus insists on the opposite true, lasting joy that fills your life to the maximum is found in remaining in the love of Jesus. Listen to what Jesus is saying, and you will find true joy by doing what he says. In verse 12, Jesus now pictures the high standard of love that is given to us. Love one another as Jesus has loved us. This is an amazing call for Jesus' disciples. Remaining in the love of Jesus means that we will love one another. If we love Jesus, then we will desire to express our love for one another. Loving Jesus leads us, then, to love others. Full joy comes from loving one another. Once again, loving others is not a dreadful duty. We are filling up our joy 
by loving others. Even though the world around us tells us that true joy is found in living for yourself, selfish living, you know, uh, loving myself first, then I can love others. I think we all recognize how empty such a lifestyle is. The Christian life isn't about loving yourself first. The Christian life is about emptying yourself and loving others. Jesus, again, gives us a countercultural, counterintuitive command that our joy will be full when we love others as Jesus has loved us. In verse 13, Jesus says something in connection with this that is truly spectacular. Jesus begins with a statement. Great love is shown by laying your life down for your friends. What more can a person do to show love for another person but to give your life for another? Now listen to what Jesus does with this in verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Jesus is going to lay down his life for his friends. We remain friends with Jesus by doing what he says. His friends are characterized by obedience. But I don't want us to pass by this description too quickly. He does not describe us as his servants. I mean, just think about that for a moment. How glorious it would be to simply be a servant of Jesus, verse 15. There's nothing better than serving our great God. However, there is something better here. And Jesus has revealed his plan to his disciples. Therefore, there are not merely servants who serve without any knowledge of what the master is doing. They are friends because they serve knowing what the master is doing. Jesus has revealed all that he has heard from the father. Jesus calls us friends. How amazing is it that God can come to us and call us his friend? There have been several in the Old Testament, particularly, that were called friends of God. I think about Abraham, for example. How amazing is that? How amazing that would be. Our joy will be full when we are friends with Jesus. We'll be friends with him when we remain in him and live in him and he in us through his words. Jesus concludes his thoughts here about making our joy full by expressing to his apostles in verse 16 how he appointed them to be his apostles. They did not choose Jesus, but Jesus chose them. Their appointment to apostleship was not based on their own merit, but by the grace of Jesus. Further, Jesus did not choose them because they were rich or powerful or eloquent. No apostle submitted a resume to be one of his chosen apostles. Jesus simply appointed them to go and bear fruit. The disciples had a mission to focus on. Those who have put on Christ are chosen to be holy and blameless before our God. To use the words of this gospel, we were chosen by God to bear fruit. God's election removes all pride and any consideration of merit and forces us to rely completely on the glorious grace of God. Looking at God's grace to love us despite our actions, we must love God and we must love one another. Of course, when you do that, verse 18, don't be surprised that you will be rejected by the world. The world rejects anyone who does not talk or act like it does. The world rejects those who do not subscribe to their value system. The temptation comes to us to mold into the world's way of thinking. The world pressures us to change our views on divorce, sexual morality, homosexuality, lying, and so many other values. But Jesus says, we will be hated by the world for upholding these beliefs. There's nothing wrong with our values, nothing wrong with our beliefs if they are from the word of God. And we should not change our thinking just because the world tells us that they will reject us. Jesus said his teachings are countercultural and will be hated by the world. Further, verse 20, Jesus wants to remind us about what happened to him. The servant is no greater than the master. If our master was hated by the world, then the servants will certainly be hated by the world. Since they persecuted Jesus, they are going to endure persecution. If the world receives the teachings of Jesus, then they'll receive your teachings. 
If the world does not receive the teachings of Jesus, they will not receive your teachings. Jesus further warns that there will be people who claim to know God, but do not know God at all. Notice that Jesus says this rejection and persecution that the disciples will experience will be done on account of the name of Jesus. These people will think they are doing the right thing. Now, next time we're going to see in John chapter 16, Jesus gives us more about this idea. And they will kill the disciples thinking that they were offering service to God. So we'll save that when we get to chapter 16. But I do want you to notice here in verse 24 that there is no excuse for their sins. They have the knowledge of Jesus and are guilty of their actions. It is not that these people did not know. They have heard. They have seen the works of Jesus, and they are found guilty. Now, I want to observe something interesting about what Jesus says. Jesus declares that ignorance leads to false worship and false service. We cannot be ignorant of the scriptures. We cannot allow ourselves to not know what God says because our ignorance will lead us to false worship and false service. This is why we see so many different denominations and religious teachings today. People are ignorant of the scriptures. We cannot fall into the same deception of just believing whatever the preacher says or the teacher says. You must know the scriptures for yourself. I try hard to assist in that and for you to see that all of our studies and teachings are centered on the scriptures. If I have failed to demonstrate where the Bible says something, let me know. I have failed in that, and I need to correct that. Every lesson is to be about opening your Bible and studying what the Bible says, not what Aaron Andrews says. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance will lead us away from the Lord. Ignorance will lead us to believe and do things that God rejects. These things are not a surprise to Jesus, and we'll see that in chapter 16. Thank you so much. Have a great and wonderful day. Yeah.